Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amma ba'da. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce you to a brand new show and a brand new podcast called The Hot Seat. To understand a little bit more about the hot seat, we first have to understand the context of the modern day world we find ourselves living in, in the year 2019. It is a world in which perhaps, perhaps there are more doubts, misconceptions and misinterpretations that are thrown around about the religion of Islam than in any other period of time in the history of mankind. The internet is a number one source used by people globally to acquire information on any topic and it is riddled and full of false notions and erroneous ideologies about the deen of Allah as the wajah. Our kids, ourselves, are being exposed to this kind of information on a daily, and if not daily, then at the very least weekly basis. And whether we know it or not, whether we choose to accept it or not, it is having an effect on ourselves, our hearts, our minds, and ultimately our understanding of this beautiful religion. To further complicate the problem, many of us find ourselves living in Western societies where the governments and the social norms and pressures are constantly trying to redefine what is good and what is bad, what is accepted and what is rejected, what Islam is and is allowed to be and what Islam is never allowed to be. All of this, my brothers and sisters, ultimately leads to confusion, it leads to ignorance and if Allah permits it can lead to misguidance. The hot seat has therefore been designed with the permission of Allah alone to counter these kind of modern day contemporary issues head on by using the knowledge and the guidance of the Muslims of the past, the early generations of Muslims, the best of generations. There's not a single Muslim on the face of the planet today that would doubt the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completed our religion for us over 1400 years ago. And that that completed, holistic, perfect religion is just as applicable now in the year 2019 as it was back then. We truly do have classical solutions for contemporary problems. However, this isn't your normal average Islamic lecture series. First of all, it's not a lecture. It's a discussion between two parties, often opposing parties, in an attempt to reach the truth. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it's a unique, one-of-its-kind interactive podcast where you, from the comfort of your own home, have the opportunity to vote for and to choose the topic we'll be discussing on the show. You also have the chance to ask your own questions on these contemporary issues and to grill the speaker if you feel like he hasn't been grilled enough on the show itself. I'll be releasing details of how you can do both of those things at the end of this episode. But for now, without any further ado, let's get into this episode of The Hot Seat. وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعْجَبْ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ustad Abdul Rahman, Jazakallah khairan once again for joining me on the hot seat. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah for having me. This was actually the first episode that we actually released a vote for the public. So they had the opportunity to go on the website, which is www.thehotseatpodcast.com, mm-hmm. and they could choose a topic that they want us to discuss. Mm-hmm. So with a resounding 64%, the topic that we're going to be discussing today is deconstructing Salafism in the 21st century. That's really what the public want us to talk about today. So I think a good place to start is with some simple definitions. What is Salafism? What is it in the language and what is it in the religion? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, lahu alhamdul hasan, wa thana'u al-jameel, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa hadahu la sharika lah, yaqulu al-haqqa wa huwa yahdi sabil, wa ashadu anna sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabih wa tabi'ina lahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd the term salaf has come in the quran in eight places no more no less eight places in the quran the meaning that it revolves around in those eight places in the quran is taqaddum wa sabq the scholars they say as-sin wal lam wal fa aslu yadullu ala taqaddum wa sabq that the sin Lam and fa salaf. 
um, it comes from ancestors. Ancestors. And predecessors. Okay. That's what it means in the uh, language. Allah says, فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ سَلَفًا وَمَثَلًا لِلْآخِرِينَ وَأَنْ تَجْمَعُ بَيْنَ الْأُخْتَيْنِ إِلَّا مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ You know, and the meaning in all of those two verses that I mentioned, and the other remaining verses is uh, ancestor and a predecessor. So it's about people who have come before us? No. Okay. And so, so is this a, a linguistic definition or is this an Islamic specific definition? This is the lexical definition, the linguistic definition. Okay. So in the Arabic language, that's what it means. And what does it mean in the religion of Islam then? Uh, in the Sharia, it means, um, the scholars, they said, it means following and being of the methodology of the three noble generation. Um, based on hadith in Sahihain, Bukhari and Muslim, in hadith Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the Prophet sallallahu he said, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ That the best of generation is my generation, and the generation that comes after, and the generation that comes after. So the Messenger, he mentioned three generations. And in another ayah, Allah Azza wa Jalla, he said, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ Again, Allah mentioned here the uh, early generation. Okay. So the scholars, they said that these three noble generation, uh, these golden generation, uh, they're the ones that are considered to be uh, the Salaf, the predecessors. Okay. Well, that's why many scholars, they say Salaf al-Salih, Salaf al-Salih. Yeah, what does that mean? Because we've heard that before as well. Pious predecessors. Okay. Meaning they've come before us, not just in time, but in piety and virtue. Because some people might say, well, Abu Jahl, yes. you know, came before, and Abu Lahab came before as well, and he was at the time of the messenger. So what we say is, we're not just looking at those who preceded us in time, but we're looking at those who preceded us in virtue as well. Okay. Uh, so they preceded us in time and virtue okay. uh, simultaneously. So those are what uh, the scholars mean when they say, Madhabu uh, Salaf, Da'watu Salaf. Okay, so that's the term Salaf. I think it's also worth clarifying terms like s- things that are, have taken the word Salaf but added things to the end. For example, you often hear the word Salafiya or Salafism. What, uh, what, do these, uh, what kind of relation does this have to the term Salaf? So the word Salafi is an ascription. You're ascribing yourself now to the early generation. Okay. You're saying, I'm, of, I'm upon their way. You're attributing yourself to them. Because in the hadith that I just mentioned, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, mm-hmm. They are the best, you know, of people. Um, so their virtue is not only uh, in their knowledge, but rather it's their knowledge, their action, and their belief. Okay. So they are virtuous in three things. Their knowledge was profound because they saw the revelation come down. They saw what was taking place at the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, secondly, their actions. When they took that knowledge from the Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, their implementation was also unprecedented. And their piety and their belief system, what they believed in and their faith and their aqidah was also uh, the best. And no one can level to them or be like them. So we're attributing ourselves. Ama, you're attributing yourself when you say Salafi, you're attributing yourself to them in knowledge, in action, and also in belief. In their creed. Okay. Th- that makes sense. And I don't think I would disagree with you when you say that they were the mo- most virtuous, they were the most knowledgeable, they were the most pious. I don't think I'll disagree with you. But why do I have to call myself Salafi? Why can't I just call myself Muslim? Mm. Uh, Allah didn't command me to call myself Salafi, did he? You see, the question that many scholars have discussed and they spoke about is, is it permissible for you uh, to attribute yourself to uh, Salafiyah and say, I am a Salafi okay, hmm. and bring that year of ascription? Say, I am a Salafi, ascribing yourself to the three noble generation. Uh, and why would one have to do that? Isn't Islam not enough? Yeah, as you just 100%. asked. You see, in the early s- stages of Islam, the early generation, when the time of the Prophet was alive, you know, everybody, whatever khilaf, whatever problems happened, it would be brought back to the Messenger. Alayhi okay. He was alive. He was the one that would correct the people's mistakes. They would refer back to him. He would solve their problems. He would answer their questions. Any inquiries that they had, it was to him that they brought it back to. After the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had died, and he already prophesied this, mm. he told us. When he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had died and he passed away, there came groups, 
people who swayed away from that path. They left that path. They left the path of the the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, the path that he left his companions on. Okay. So their gr- groups came. The Khawarij, for example, the early group that came. They came and they labeled the people disbelievers uh, and they caused havoc and corruption on the earth. And also then the Rafida came, uh, the Murji'a, and then the Mu'tazila okay. came. So different groups. So different, different groups came, which some of those groups are still Muslims. Mm-hmm. They, yeah, agreed. They, agreed. They, they're considered to be from within Islam. So the early generation, generation, the noble generation, the scholars of that time, who were still upon the path, path of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, they th- saw it to be necessary by unanimous agreement that they need to distinguish themselves from these groups. I mean, these groups, they are, some of them are Muslims, but you saying I'm a Muslim and them calling themselves a Muslim, it doesn't distinguish one from the other. So they wanted to say that you guys, since you walked away from the path of the early generation, that which the messenger was upon and his mm-hmm. companions, we're going to attribute ourselves to those early generation, to the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions. And so we're going to be called Salafi. Uh, we're going to attribute ourselves to them. Because if you look at all of these groups, they got attributed to either a leader from the group or they got attributed to a corrupt belief that they held. So give an example of what you mean. Like for example, the Khawarij. Hmm. They were called Khawarij because they rebelled against the Muslim leader, which was a creedal problem. Okay. So they got called Khawarij. Kharaju, they walked away and they left uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Hmm. Uh, so they got called Khawarij. They got attributed to that, uh, that misguided uh, belief of theirs. So it's, it's a way of distinction, basically, to say that I'm not following any kind of innovated ideology. I'm following the ideology of the, as you said, Salaf al-Salih, the pious predecessors. I would question, however, is that even still relevant in the modern world? It might have been many centuries ago. When you say I'm Salafi, people automatically understand what you're saying. But in the, the 21st century, in the year 2019, we have so many different groups of Salafis. This one's claiming he's Salafi, this one's claiming he's Salafi, and this one's claiming he's Salafi. So by saying that I'm Salafi, you're not really distinguishing yourself from anybody. You could be a Salafi jihadi, you could be a political, someone who's inclined towards politics, or you could be someone who's just involved in teaching and tarbiyah and not really concerned with politics. So all of these are Salafis, are they not? You see, um, one part I do want to mention, which is I think is a contention that many people have, or a point that many people bring up, which is um, they might even question whether the early generation call themselves Salafis. Yeah. Like they will say, were there people called Salafis? You know, is this even true? Can, were, can you give us examples and proofs? So I think that also needs to be put there okay. before the answering of that question. Before we get that, was it mentioned in the Quran? It's not Salaf, like you mentioned, that was mentioned eight times. Salafi, was that word mentioned in the Quran? You see, the term Salafi, as I said to you, it became a consensus amongst the, the early generation. It became a consensus uh, that you can attribute yourself to Salafi. You could call yourself by that name. That it's permissible, not not that it's obligatory, okay. but it's permissible, okay. and 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 that a consensus was transmitted as well that if a person does attribute himself to Salafiyyah, you would have to accept it from him. I mean, let, let me give you one person who transmitted that consensus. Shaykh Al Islam Taymiyyah, rahimahullah taala, in his Majmu' Al Fatawa, he said, "Wala aiba." There's no blame on the person. Man uh, intasaba ila madhab salaf The one who attributes himself to the madhab uh, al-Salaf, adhara madhab al-Salaf, or he. Uh, shows himself to be upon the madhab of the salaf. When tasaba ilay and he attributes himself to it, wa ataza and calls the people to it, you know. And then he said, rahimahullah uh, taala. He said, wa yajibu qabula dalika minhu. And if he does say I'm a salafi, and he attributes himself to the salaf, he said wa yajibu. It is obligatory to accept that from him. Bil tifaq by consensus. Okay, so someone says I'm salafi. Doesn't matter what they believe, what their actions are. You just we just agree so, he's salafi. Beautiful. So when a person says I am a salafi, yeah. Just like if a person said, I'm a Muslim, yeah. then we accept it from him. Okay, agreed. And then after that, we have the rights to see if what he said is in line with what Salafiyah is. You know, just like the Munafiqeen, the Messenger, some of them were lying. Right. And so they came and they showed themselves to be Muslims. And the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa accepted Islam from them. But as time went on, it became clear uh, from their actions 
you know, or that which they brought out apparent that they were not Muslims. So how they do we know if someone is Salafi or someone is just saying I'm a Salafi? What, what, how do if we a know? person's showing us that he's a Salafi, then we accept it from him, even if he doesn't believe it in his heart, because that same statement of Ibn Taymiyyah, that same question is what he was answering, which is, he said, if someone shows us Salafiyyah, we will accept it from him, just like we would accept somebody, their Islam from them. If he okay. says, I'm a Muslim, from the apparent, because we were not, uh, Sheikh Hussam Taymiyyah says in that same quote, he said, we were not, uh, we were not placed as, one, as ones to judge people's intentions. We're here to just rule and judge people based on their apparent action. Mm -hmm. So if a person says, I'm a Salafi, we'll, say, we'll take it from him. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't say, but your heart, this isn't what's in your heart, or this is not true, or that's not our job. But okay. if after that he doesn't show what Salafiyah is, and he doesn't hold on to Salafiyah, um, he doesn't come with the simat, the usul that Salafiyah stands on. Sorry, simat, usul. Characteristics and the foundations that Salafiyah stands on. If he doesn't come with that, then it's just like somebody claiming Islam and, and not really being a Muslim. Like if a Qadiani says, I'm a Muslim, mm. you wouldn't accept it from him, right? Okay, because so he goes against a fundamental issue. So then what is the belief of a Salafi then? Uh, uh, just, just one quote that would be very nice in this issue is that Al-Imam uh, Al Al-Dhahabi uh, in Seer Alam al Bala, when he spoke about um, when he spoke about Adara Qutni, for example, Adara Qutni is a great Imam, okay. uh, a scholar of Hadith. Um, he was amazing in Hadith. I, I don't know how to praise him. This <laughs> Adara Qutni, his name. He came to Baghdad and he said to the people of Baghdad, "Don't worry. As long as I live amongst you, there's no one who can lie about the Prophet. I will make sure mm. that the Hadith of the Prophet are clarified." This is the type of person he was. So look at what Al Imam al Dhahabi said in his. Seer um, Alam Nubala about him. He said that that it was authentically transmitted from Dar Qutni that he said, Ma shay'un abghada ilayya min ilm al kalam. There is nothing I hate more than philosophy. I hate ilm al kalam. I hate that science. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dhabi then straight away when he brought that statement of Dar Qutni, he commented on it right under it. Okay. He said, "Lam yadkhul abadan fi ilm al-kalam." This man had never spoken, nor has he entered into this subject, philosophy, wal al-jidal, and he never went into this um, sophistry and debate tactics. He didn't waste his time on all of this. Wala khada fi dalik, and he didn't indulge into that. But why? Bal kana salafiyan. He said, "Dhabi." He was a salafi. He, was, he used the word salafi. Bal kana salafiyan. He said he was a salafi. He okay. was a salafi. So. Salafi is known from there as Dar Qutni when he was talking about him, Dhabi, that Salafi has the characteristics, things that he's known for, things he does. It's not just Mujarrad al da'awa, mm -hmm. it's not just a mere claim. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us in the hadith, Law nasa bi if everybody was given what they claimed, let da'a rijal amwala qawmin. A group of people claim the blood and the wealth of a group of people. I would come and say, Akhi, that watch you're wearing well, yeah, yeah. and that thobe that you're wearing is mine. I would claim that you killed my father or you killed my cousin or you killed my uncle, so give me blood money. Mm. Like in the Prophet said, The one who claims has to bring evidence for his claim. So if a person says, I'm a Salafi, Salafi has usul, has foundations, it has principles. Okay. If you're not in line with those principles, not, it's not that any, someone's chosen to take you out of Salafiyah, it's not that someone's, someone's out there to, to take you out of Salafiyah, but it's just you haven't Fulfill the criteria of what Salafiyah is. You've not come with the uh, the requirement of Salafiyah. No. Okay. I think one of the most ironic things about Salafis is, and people who ascribe themselves to Salafiyah, is that they're always talking about the past, the glory days of the past, that we should return to the early three, the first three generations, like you yourself mentioned just now. Yet, the movement of Salafism or Salafiyah is a relatively new movement. It really started and it really gained weight and traction from Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in the 18th century. He was passed away in 1792, so we're talking about the 18th century. And then more recently, you have the University of Medina established in the 1961, and that's really what propagated a lot of Salafis to go around the globe and say, spread the Salafi da'wah. Really, both of these things are very recent. The 18th century is really not that far long ago when you consider the history of Islam. So why is this contradiction present? People saying we should return to the early generations, yet this is a completely new movement. That's not fair to say. 
And that's not true. And anyone who does say that, uh, they don't have a proof for that. And that's just a mere claim again. The reason why it's a mere claim is because uh, Salafiyah, in Wallahi, one sentence, Salafiyah is the pure Islam. That's all it is. Every group claims that. Okay. Salafiyah doesn't have a leader. Every group has a leader that runs it. Well, I'll tell you something. Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah, Muhammad Nasir al-Din al-Albani, rahimahullah. There was a kitab he wrote, he called it, he called it, Haqiqatul Tawassul. Haqiqatul Tawassul. Where he talks about whether Tawassul is permissible or not. It's an aqidah book. Okay. And he talks in there. In that book of his, when he was authoring it, I'm paraphrasing, inshallah. Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he was writing that book, in there, he mentioned that he stood over a book written by another sheikh, another Salafi sheikh, whose name is Muhammad, Rasib, Muhammad Nasib al-Rifai. Okay. Sheikh Albani said, I have stood over the book written by Muhammad, Rasib, uh, Muhammad Nasib al-Rifai. Sheikh Albani saying this. I've stood over his book whilst I was writing this book. But he said, I have to point out something. Sheikh Albani saying this. And he used the word, من حيث الأمانة العلمية for the sake of being a trustworthy person and fair in the academic world I have to point something out okay fine because Muhammad Nasib and Rifa'i and Sheikh Al-Bani were calling to the same thing but he said I still have to be honest and say something and he said that uh, Muhammad Nasib and Rifa'i's kitab when it came out at the front of the book he wrote on it مؤسسة uh, uh, the establisher uh, of مؤسس um, uh, sorry of دعوة uh, السلفية he called himself that name. He called himself what? What is he, the full name in English? He said that I'm the establisher of Da'wah Salafiyya. And he meant an organization he made. Okay. Which was Salafi organization. And he called himself the Qadimuha, the server of it. And Sheikh Albani said that we don't accept this from the Sheikh. For him to use this, hmm. which goes back to the question you asked. Yeah. He said we don't accept this from him. And he said it's wrong for him to claim this. And Sheikh Albani, rahimahullah, said if anybody, did, anybody does claim that, it can also reach Kufr and Shirk. Okay. Because Islam, Nabi Allah Azza wa Jalla brought it. It's Allah's religion. And even Albani went on to say that Salafiyya, Nabi Muhammad didn't even bring it. It came from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Nabi Muhammad mm. took it from Allah Azza wa Jalla. So Salafism, um, Salafiyya, is the pure essence of Islam. It's the untainted version of Al Islam. It is Qala Allahu, Qala Rasulu, Qala Sahaba to whom the will Irfani. It is Allah said, the Messenger said. And the early generation, meaning the Sahabas and those who follow them in good, what they said. Nothing more, nothing less. So where was it before the 18th century? You see, are you talking about the methodology or the name? I'm talking about the, as we know it in the modern world, not necessarily the name, because we already talked about the name. I'm talking about the methodology, the movement, the The methodology revival. was always there. I told you that. This is the methodology of Nabi Muhammad. This is what Nabi Muhammad was upon. This is what Abu Bakr was upon. This is what Umar was upon. Uthman was upon this. Imam Malik was upon this. Imam Shafi'i was upon this. And, you know, from the Tabi'een, you know, Sa'id ibn Jubair was upon this. Abu Mujahid was upon this. You see, this is, they passed this on to each other. They were always there. They always there. Till today. We took it from one, hmm. took it from the other one, took it from the other one. Salafi was always there. But if you're asking me the name, I, I told you the name. Yeah. The name was done when deviated groups came. Deviated groups came. And when those deviated groups came, it became necessary for the people of the Sunnah, for the people of Aqidati Ahlul Sunnah, mm. not just the name Salafi was coined. Ahlul Sunnah was also a term that was coined uh, at that point. And the reason why it was coined was to distinguish themselves from those groups, okay. from those okay. ideologies. Okay. So saying that Salafiyah started now, is saying that the pure Islam started now. And that's dhulm, that's oppression, okay. that's, that's wrong. Fine. That's Fine. Uh, however, in the modern world, in 2019, is it even possible to go back to the way that the 7th century Arabs lived in the desert? They didn't drive cars, they didn't have microphones. So aren't you contradicting yourself by saying, I'm Salafi, I'm Salafi, yet using all of these modern means? You see, when we say Salafi, we're talking about a creedal issue. We're talking about, sorry, religious issue, sorry. Okay. We're talking about a religious issue. You know, in the, in the dunya, Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us to innovate. Allah wa ta'ala tells us to progress. You see, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in the hadith, Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. You know your worldly affairs. Mm -hmm. So, the majal and the discussion, the dialogue and the discussion is not about how people want to live uh, in the dunya, what kind of business that they want to make, what car, kind of cars they want to drive. Okay. Do they want to 
you know, have a Samsung mobile phone or do they want to have an iPhone? This is not what the discussion really is about. The discussion here is your knowledge of the deen, who do you take it from? Hmm. This action that you're doing right now, where did you get it from? This belief that you have, who can you attribute it to? You see, how far does it go to the Prophet ﷺ? Okay, would you agree that the world we live in, I mean, as, uh, even from a religious aspect, the, the way of practicing our religion, the different groups, the different ideologies, is different now than it was in the 7th century? Would you agree with that? As in what do you mean? As in like the, even the way we practice our religion and some of the new issues and that are coming into our religion, things that we need rulings on, they're always changing, they're always new issues that the Salaf or the people before us never experienced. And obviously our religion encompasses the dunya. So if something new in the dunya comes, we need to understand the ruling of it. What you, there's new issues that are coming to uh, light. Uh. These things that the Salaf never had to deal with uh. before. So how can we say then we need to return to them, we need to return to them when they never experienced these issues? So this is a very important question that many people uh, have, but they don't structure it correctly in the way okay. they want to ask. How do you reconcile between following the early generation, meaning the Sahabas and Tabi'in and the Tabi'i Tabi'in, the theory of golden generation, yeah. and the concept of ijtihad is opened. Not just ijtihad is open, but the, th the, the issues we're dealing with. For example, uh, let's say, I know it's a dunya issue, the internet, for example, but we need to know, know the religious ruling of using the internet. Is it permissible? Is it obligatory? Et cetera, et cetera. So it does affect our religion, mm. but they never had the internet. Okay. Yeah. So again, we need to distinguish one from the other, that the internet itself is a worldly issue. Yeah, agreed. It's a, it's a worldly issue. So, um, there was no objection in that concept. As long as it doesn't have a shara'i problem in it, it's a worldly issue, you can use it as you wish. You can utilize it as you wish. As long as it doesn't come with a mahdur min, mah min mahadir shara'. As long as it doesn't come with a pre religious prohibition. Okay. And the concept of you know, our religion, you're right, it did, the, uh, the Quran and the Sunnah doesn't give a ruling for internet and doesn't state yes. internet by name. But as the poet said, Yes, you're right. Our Meaning, religion, sorry, sorry, just give me a summary. Sorry. Yeah, so our, our Quran doesn't talk about IVF per, per se. Yeah. It doesn't speak about smoking per se. And it doesn't talk about drugs per se. It doesn't talk about internet per se. It doesn't talk about coffee per se. Of course, you're not going to find those things, you know, individually mentioned. But you find principles you can take all of those back to. Okay. So fine. it has qawaid. It has principles. Those are the principles that a person needs to study and learn, which the early generation knew of. So a lot of these things that you're seeing today happening, that you're seeing as the nawazil, contemporary issues, they all go back to these qawaid. Hence why we put this podcast together in the first yeah. place. We want to show that these contemporary problems, they have classical solutions. What do we mean by it has classical solutions? It means that we can take it back to an ayah and a hadith. We can take it back to a uh, we can take it back to um, uh, uh, legal maxims that the scholars have written. Okay. Bawabid shar'iyya and qawaid fiqhiyya. I'll give you one example and one story that I've mentioned before. At the time of um, Uthman ibn Affan, Ibn Abdul Bar mentioned this in his kitab at Timheed. The time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a man accused his wife of zina. He accused her, he accused, accused her of adultery. Mm -hmm. He said that she's committed uh, zina. Uh, and the reason why he accused her of that is because she gave birth six months into her pregnancy. So he said, this woman was pregnant before I got married to her. Because when he got married to her, six months after that, he got married to her six months after the marriage, she's, she's given birth to a child. Okay. So he accused her of zina. And she said, this woman, she got, she got this child before me. So, the hukum shara'i was going to be passed on her. The Islamic law and this issue was going to be passed on her. Ali Nabi Talib in hastened to speak on this issue. And he said that this woman, she's not, uh, was, she's not what's been accused about her. Okay. So the question is how hard? Again, this is a contemporary issue. Yeah. He said that she can give birth at six months. It's normal, it can happen. Okay, question is where did you get that from? 
So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said that it comes from the ayah where Allah says, وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا That the pregnancy and the breastfeeding, Allah said it's 30 months. ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا The pregnancy and the breastfeeding is 30 months. All together. Okay. We already in our religion know, uh, I mean another ayah we already know, that the breastfeeding is 24 months. Okay. Because Allah said, وَالْوَالِدَاتُ يُرْضِعْنَ أَوْلَادَهُنَّ حَوْلَيْنِ Kamilaini, that the mother would breastfeed her child for two two years. Two years is twenty four months. Yep. So if you subtract from that thirty months, you subtract the twenty four, which is the breastfeeding. Yeah, you get six. That six is the pregnancy, right? Hmm. So the Sahabas they they used qawaid principles. They used okay. evidences. They learned how to utilize it. So any issues that we have, we can always do that. We can always find ahkam, jurisprudent rulings to to respond to it. But it's just when we become distanced from the Qur'an, when we become distanced from the Sunnah, and when we become distanced from the fiqh of the Salaf, hmm. then of course we will... Okay, uh, perhaps I agree with you on micro issues like pregnancy and internet and things like this. But we're also facing large macro issues that we're going through. For example, uh, the allegiance of some uh, um, Muslim rulers with non-Muslim rulers, and we have other things where we Islam has really been attacked in the modern world. There's no doubt about it. Mm. Islam is seeing is being seen as a scapegoat, and it's really being attacked by all fronts. Mm. And now we have certain issues of um, whether how we overcome these challenges. Do you honestly believe, with your hand on your heart, that li- sitting in a masjid, reading books, and going back to this, these classical books are really going to solve these real life issues that are in front of us right now? Nabi Lai Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one day he came into the masjid, he led Salatul Fajr, and he stood up, and he gave a khutbah after Salatul Fajr. Hmm. And then he carried on giving a khutbah until Dhuhr. And then he led Dhuhr. And then he done a khutbah after Dhuhr, until Asr. Okay. And then he led Asr. And then he done a khutbah after Asr, until Maghrib. And then he led Maghrib. And then he done a khutbah f- after Maghrib, until Isha. And then he left, led Isha, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of that, what did he say, tell them? The narrator, he said, he told us what was and what is going to happen. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He told them about the trials and tribulations that are going to come. The Sahabi, the narrator, he said, Hafidahu man hafidahu, am alimahu man alimahu, wa jahilahu man jahilahu. The one who'd memorized it, that day memorized it, and the one who uh, was ignorant about it, was ignorant about it. In other words, Nabi Muhammad told them everything that they need. Hmm. Your question here is that uh, did Nabi Muhammad ex- did he leave us upon clarity in everything that we need? Of, of course, I'm going to say yes to you. Yeah, question, I left you upon clear cut. I left you upon a white road. The day is like a night, meaning it's a road. There's no night. It's all day. Layluha kana hariha la yazigu anha illa halik. And so the Quran and the Sunnah has all of the guidance we need. Or even though we're living in a fast-paced, ever-changing world, we don't need any other guidance outside the Quran. Allah says in this Quran, "Yahdi lil latihi aqwam." That this Quran will guide you to the best of affairs. Aqwam, of course it does. The Messenger of Allah said in a hadith, "Taraktukum, ma in tamasaktum bihi." I have left with you something. If you hold on to, lan tadillu baadi. You will never be misguided after me. Kitab Allah wa Sunnati, the Book of Allah, and I left the Sunnah with you. So yes, everything that we will need. Is right in the book and it's also in the sunnah. Ustad, I hear what you're saying about Salafiyah and Salafism, but isn't this just referring to a period of time that happened in the past? And I get that it was a very virtuous, amazing period of time, but it's gone. It's happened in the past, it's gone. We're now in a different period of time. Why do we still need to keep referring back to that? Um, that claim is not new, Haqiqatan. It's, it's not a new claim. It's not something new that hasn't been said before. Um, when was it said before? I mean, Abdullah ibn Yusuf al who lives in the UK, I mean, he pushes that. He says that it's a marhala uh, zamaniya. Bouti said the same. Muhammad Ali Sabuni said the same. Many people said that. And the scholars of their time responded back to them. Ibn Baz responded to that. Sheikh Al-Albani responded to that. Uh, Legend al Daima responded to that. Uh, you know, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al uthaymin also responded to that. But the truth is that the Salafi madhab, as I said to you before, it's a madhab that... Early scholars attributed them sem- themselves to it. And those who come after, including Ibn Taymi, rahimahullah, who came, he attributed himself to the Salaf oh. Dawah. There's a kitab written by Muhammad Khalil al-Harras. Uh, he called it uh, Ibn Taymiyyah as Salafi. And in that book he mentioned 
that Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah uh, was uh, a person, he and his students, mm-hmm. they used to attribute themselves to Salafiyyah. They, they used to call themselves, they used not to call calling them. someone else, like the Dara Qutni example you gave, no, they yeah. now calling themselves. Yeah, they would call themselves Salafi. I mean, there's many scholars I can give you that call themselves Salafi. Like, for example, Al-Imam al-Jazari, I mean, whether he was Salafi or not, that's another mm-hmm. discussion. He called himself Salafi. For example, in his Kitab Al Hidayah fi Ilm al Riwaya, he, so, he says, Yaqulu Raji Afi Rabbin Raufi al Muhammad ibn al Jazari is Salafi. He calls himself okay. Ibn al Jazari as Salafi, he calls himself. I mean, um, what's his name? Uh, Al Imam Al Samani has a Kitab called Al Ansab. Mm. This book is talking about people, what they ascribe to themselves. Okay. So in that book, he says, As Salafi, bi Fatih al Sini, Wal Lami, wa fi Akhiri al Fa. Salafi, Sin, Lam, Fa, he says. Right. And he said, هذه النسبة, that this term, uh, Salafi, is نسبة إلى السلف. It's attributing, ascribing yourself. He said, it's ascribing yourself to the Salaf. وانتحال مذهبهم. And you're attributing yourself, and you're connecting yourself to their madhab. Right after that, that statement of uh, Sam'ani. And Sam'ani, mm-hmm. he died the year uh, 563 Hijriya. He's a 6th century scholar. 6th century, okay. 6th century scholar. After him came another imam called Ibn Athir, rahimahullah. Ibn Athir, he summarized the kitab Al-Ansab by Sam'ani. He summarized it in a kitab where he called it Al-Lubab fi Tahdib Al-Ansab. Al-Lubab fi Tahdib Al-Ansab. And he, he pointed out under the statement of Sanaani, or he mentioned under the statement of Sanaani, and he said, وَعُرِفَ بِهِ جَمَاعَ A group of people were known as to be mm-hmm. Salafi. They were known to be a Salafi. Nasruddin al-Dimashqi, for example, has a kitab called uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm not interested in these uh, people who came after the 5th century, the 6th century, because mm. you told me at the start that it's all about the first three generations. Do we find it in those three generations? Scholars that were called or they call themselves yes. Salafi. For example, Al Imam, I was going to mention to you Nasr al-Din al Dimashqi, for example, in his Kitab Tawdih al Mushtabah, he says, Was Salafi in Bil Fatah? Salafi, with a Fatah. Because he wants to get rid of the, the word as Salafi. Salafi okay. is different from a Salafi. A okay. Sulafi is different from a Salafi. So he clearly says to you, As Salafi Bil Fatah. And then he mentions Abu Bakr Abdul Rahman ibn Abdullah ibn Ahmad as Sarkhasi, as Salafi. And then he said, سَمِعَ بَالْفَتِيَانَ الرُّؤَاسِ وَكَذَا مَنْ إِنْتَسَبَ إِلَى السَّلَفِ So this man was an early Salaf time. Uh, even before I mean, the likes of all, Ibn Taymiyyah? All of, way, way before all of that. And okay. he, he said in that book, uh, Nasir al-Din al-Dimashqi said, that this man, uh, Abu Bakr Abdul Rahman ibn Abdullah ibn Ahmed al-Sarakhsi, you can say if you want, or you can say al-Sarakhsi, hmm. al-Salafi, he said he heard from Aba, uh, Abu al-Fatiyan al-Ru'asi, and he said, وَكَذَا مَنْ إِنْتَسَبَ إِلَى السَّلَفِ And anyone like him who attributed themselves to the Salaf. Okay, fine. So we have narrations from people in the past, very early on, calling themselves Salafi and calling other Salafi. And That's quotes that. of uh, Abu al-Qasim al-Tayim in his Kitab al-Hujjah fi Bayani al-Mahajjah. It's from the early scholars of the Salaf. Allahum musta'an ala ma tasifun. Imam al-Uzari, he said statements that are also like that and mm. similar to that, which uh, uh, Ibn Qudama mentions in his Kitab al-Lum'a. Okay. Uh, Lum'a al-Atiqal, sorry. Okay, fine. So they, they uh, mentioned that. So what is the exact ruling then? Is it, You have to call yourself Salafi? Is it obligatory? Is it just permissible? Uh, no, it's not. You don't have to call yourself Salafi, but it's something that's permissible if a person calls themselves Salafi that we should accept it from them by consensus. As I mentioned, the statement of Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah where he says, وَلَا عَيْبَ عَلَى مَنْ أَظْهَرَ السَّلَفِ عَلَى أَمَا مَنْ أَظْهَرَ مَذْهَبِ السَّلَفِ وَانْتَسَبَ إِلَيْهِ وَاعْتَزَى بَلْ يَجِبُ قَبُولُ ذَلِكَ مِنْهُ بِالِاتِّفَاقِ فَإِنَّ مَذْهَبِ السَّلَفِ لَا يَكُونُ إِلَّا حَقَّا That if a person, he said there's no blame on a person who shows Madhabu Salaf. Okay, shows. And, a, and attributes himself to the Madhabu Salaf. Okay. And calls to the Madhabu Salaf. He says, بَلْ يَجِبُ قَبُولُ ذَلِكَ مِنْهُ It is obligatory to accept that from him. بِلِتِفَاقِ By consensus. There's no difference of opinion. You accept it from him. Hmm. And then look what he said after that. He said, فَإِنَّ مَذْهَبَ السَّلَفِ لَا يَكُونُ إِلَّا حَقَّا Because the Madhab of the Salaf is nothing except the truth. Okay. So the, the Madhab of Salaf is the truth now and it's going to be the truth until the Day of Judgment. As I said before, Salaf, I'm a Salafi, I'm a Madhab of Salaf, it is the pure Islam. And it will be until the Day of Judgment. Okay, so as long as you have the Madhab of the Salaf, like the, the, the way of the Salaf on you, you don't have to call yourself Salafi if no, you don't want to. It's more yourself. about the actions, the belief, the methodology. Even though the Shaykh Nubaz, rahimahullah ta'ala, he did say it was, it's an obligatory really? uh, yeah, a statement like that. He said Shaykh okay. Nubaz, rahimahullah ta'ala. Okay, but really the majority view is that it's not obligatory mm-hmm. upon you mm-hmm. and it's just permissible. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. Why in the 21st century, because obviously we're talking about scholars of the past here, 
now we're dealing with issues that we live in in today's world. In the 21st century, you see the Salafis focusing on really obscure issues. For example, how do we interpret the names and attributes of Allah? Does Allah have a hand, for example? These, these, these aren't going to solve the real life issues that we're, we're, we're facing in the real world. We have much bigger fish to fry. We've got much bigger issues to deal with. Why, why are so many Salafis focusing on these small, obscure issues? It's really wrong for a person to dismiss and also to undermine and to belittle, to be honest, uh, things that great noble imams died for. And Imam Muhammad was whipped for and he was imprisoned because of it. It's very sad that somebody would undermine what uh, Abu Yaqub al Buayti, rahimahullah, was imprisoned for. And he was, you know, and great scholars, Ahmad al Khuzai and others, they were killed because of it. Some mm. great imams were killed because of the issue of Allah's names and attributes. To undermine those great imams is really a sad reality to see people undermining that. Why would you need to undermine it? Why don't you say we also have new contemporary issues that also need to be tackled? Because our time is limited, Ustad. Okay, well, don't undermine the other previous issues of Aqidah. You can't undermine them. They are issues that are really connected to. Even if you think about it, Allah's names and attributes is the discussion of today. It's actually what's coming up back and forth. Like, for example, when people ask, you know, uh, the concept of good and evil, you're asking about Allah's actions, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's all interconnected. It's all uh, connected to our contemporary problems. Does, you know, does Allah, you know, does he do all of this evil when he's the, uh, you know, the most merciful, the most kind, the most generous, and he's watching his slaves being destroyed and this and that. These doubts that atheists are pushing forward, it's all connected to Allah's actions. And how does Allah do things? And the concept of free will goes back again to Allah's actions, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the actions of the creation, or whether Allah created the creation's actions. So, Okay, but how does if Allah has a hand affect anything, anything in the modern world? I understand we refute atheist claims that are coming forward about free will and divine decree, but no atheist is talking about Allah's hand, whether he has a hand. I mean, it's a distraction from the real life issues. It's not really, because um, these are the concepts that um, Christians are discussing, whether Jesus is a divine and a human at the same time, and what are the features of uh, can you be divine and can you be human at the same time? You know, these are attributes of Allah Azza wa Jalla we're discussing here right now. Hmm. You see, they are life issues that uh, I have brothers who are at the forefront of debating and discussing with atheists. They are at the forefront of discussing with Christians. And they call me and they ask me questions to do with uh, Allah's names and attributes. I'll give you an example. خَلَقَ اللَّهُ آدَمْ عَلَى صُورَةِ الرَّحْمَانِ Allah created Adam in the form of Adam hmm. alayhi salam. Hmm. What does that hadith actually mean? Hmm. What's the correct understanding? I get that asked and I always have to respond and I always have to respond and give explanations to that hadith. Are you with me? Yeah. That's Allah's characteristics and attributes here. Mm. That Ibn Khuzayma wrote a kitab and discussed it. You see, Ibn Qayyim uh, mentions it in his kitab Muqtasar Sawa'iq al Mursala and Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah mentions it in his Aqid al wasatiyah and great other scholars talk about. So they're not trivial issues that the Salaf spoke about and now it's gone. It's not taking... No, it's those issues if you don't understand your verdicts and your answers to these contemporary problems will not be correct. Okay, fine. Why is there so much harshness that we see amongst the Salafis today? That's a, that's a reality that can't be denied. You see, I'm not here to defend Salafis. They can be right and they can be wrong, Salafis. Okay. But I'm talking about the Madhab. See, the Madhab is infallible. The Madhab is free from errors and mistakes. You see, just like a Muslim cannot talk for the Muslims, he can talk for Islam and the religion. Mm, yeah. There can't be Muslims that drink. There can't be Muslims that you know, commit zina. There can't be Muslims that cheat. You see, this concept of you know, a person has to um, uh, dismantle case-by-case -case situation where I have to talk about every single yeah. point in order, my, in order for my argument to be valid, it's, 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 not, it's not correct. It's not fair. Okay. It's not... It's not it's not looking at it in the right way. I mean, there can be people who attribute themselves to Salafiyya, but do wrong things, who don't come with, you know, you know, da'at and obedience. You see, Salafiyya isn't just a aqidah issue. Salafiyya, as I said to you, is the pure essence of Islam. So it enters everything. It then enters the way you deal with your wife and how you are to your wife and how you are to your neighbors. Salafiyya is that. Salafiyya is how you are towards your children. Salafiyya is how you are in terms of your salah and the jama'ah. And the congregation. Salafiyya is how you pray. Salafiyya is how you dress. And this is the sad reality where there are some people today, they saw the Salafi 
you know, community. They saw some people attribute themselves to Salafia yeah. who give so much importance to the outer appearance. They give so much importance to the outer appearance, which is wrong. The person should first of all work on the inner, 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 inner essence of himself, like his heart. So they saw a people who've given more importance to their outer appearance, whereas their heart is more tainted. And so what did they do? They then undermined the outer appearance. Right, they went to the other extreme. The other extreme. So no, Salafia is that you work on both. Okay. Your outer appearance is uh, good and it's upright. And so is, number one, your inner essence, your heart. Without a doubt. One does not eliminate the other. Allah said about the Jews and the Christians, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَهُمْ يَتْرُونَ الْكِتَابِ Both parties, the truth was amongst them. They had elements of truth within mm. themselves. This group had one, a portion of the truth, and this one had a portion of the truth, yeah. But each one was saying to the other group, you know, you're wrong because you're a Christian. Right. I'm going to take it from you. And the Christian was saying to the Jew, you're a Jew, I'm not taking anything from you. Meaning, they weren't taking the truth that was with these people. Okay. Okay, um, final question before I move on to a topic that I really want to address, which is the different types of Salafis that we see in the modern world. But just before we get onto that, another thing that is very, very common is you often see Salafis having this really uh, fanaticism towards Saudi Arabia. Is this part of Salafia then to, be, to have a fanaticism towards Saudi Arabia, Arabia or is this something that just the Salafis do? I mean, again, it brings me back to the point I was mentioning, which is you can't find Salafis do things and say things. You can't see Salafis act in a particular way. That doesn't in any way, shape or form uh, have anything to do with Salafia itself, the madhab. Okay. Munafiqeen attributed themselves to Islam. Can we now then say this is what Muslims are like? No. You know. Yeah, I understand. That's, that's the reality. A, that's a point well proven. So uh, whoever you find, when we look at madhab with Salaf, and we look at the methodology of the Salaf, and we find that individual not in line with the Quran and the Sunnah, He's not in line with how the companions were. Hmm. Then what we say is, you are not Salafi. However much l claims that you put forward, however much you say you are Salafi. Okay. Because this is what Salafi stands on. These are the usul of the Salaf uh, Salafiyyah. This is the foundation of Salafiyyah. So I can't defend individuals. Okay. My job isn't to defend a, a, sh a particular sheikh or I'm not here to defend a, you know, uh, you know, a particular individual in the da'wah scene or something like that. I can only speak for this madhab. Hmm. You know, فَإِنَّ الْحَيَّ لَا تُؤْمَنُ عَلَيْهِ الْفِتْنَةِ A person who's alive, no one can give them reassurance. If you're alive, you can do mistakes. Does that mean madhab is self is wrong? Yeah, okay. No, I understand. Okay, so I agree with you that just because someone calls themselves a Salafi or ascribes themselves to Salafi, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily following the right path of a Salafi and they could have uh, issues within themselves it doesn't mean that the the the, the methodology of uh, a salafi or methodology of salafia is uh, is free from that basically it's free from those errors and mistakes but we do see in the modern world different categorizations of salafis whether we look in the islamic world or more predominantly in the in the academic western world where people like quinton victorowix for example has separated salafis into different groups and he comes with three main groups. He comes with the purist Salafis, who are really only concerned with the way the teaching Islam, the way it used to be, and they're not really involved in politics or anything like that. Then you have the politicos, as he calls them, who are, again, they call themselves Salafi. They believe that the th early three generations were the best of generations, but they have a different methodology slightly to get to the same goal, which is let's work with the political system and let's change the system from within in order to reach our mm, goal. Mm, and then mm. you have the third group, which is obviously the jihadis, which mm. are well known as ISIS, Osama bin Laden, people like this. Are all three of these Salafis, like Wick Tolowick's claims, for example? You see, um, uh, academics, Western academics, for example, yeah. their way of looking at Salafia is based on anyone who comes from, for example, Saudi Arabia is a Salafi by default. You know, whatever okay. ideology he pushes, whatever belief he has, so all of these three, all of these three groups. If you look at who he named for each group, like uh, the, uh, the jihadis, he Osama bin Laden because he's Saudi, and the politicals, for example, he would choose Safar al Hawali and Salman al Aoud because they're Saudis, and the purists, for example, for him it's uh, the Mufti of Saudi Arabia and Sheikh Ibn Baz and Ibn Uthaymin and uh, Ibn uh, Sheikh Fawzan and others right. because they're all Saudis. So for the him, Salafia is Saudi. Okay. 
and that's incorrect. I told you, Salafia is the pure essence of Islam. Salafia is before Saudi Arabia came into the picture. Okay. Salafia is before even the da'wah of Muhammad and Abdul Wahab, way before all of that, way before Ibn Taymiyyah. If Ibn Taymiyyah didn't follow the madhab of Salaf, he'll be misguided, you see? This yeah, madhab yeah. is not individuals, it's not pe- you know, you either follow it and this is his criteria, or you're out, you're not in it. So what I mean by that is um, that belief where these are Salafis because they are from a particular land and that's what brings them to Salafia is a fallacy. It's, mm. a, it's a, a mistaken belief and an unreasonable argument. But Salafi, as I tell you, it has usul, it has foundations. Yes. We need to look at if all of these three groups, which of those followed, we need to look at which one of them followed the what Salafiya considers it, and what can Salafiya is, the usul and the foundations of Salafiya. So we look at Salafiya stands on al-ikhlas, sincerity. Mm. Salafiya stands on al-ittiba', follow the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And the third thing that Salafiya stands on is at tazkiyah So we look at sincerity. Sorry, at tazkiyah meaning? Tazkiyah is purification. Okay. So we look at Salafiya in terms of uh, ikhlas. Ikhlas meaning Salafiya is about tawheed, oneness of Allah. They don't associate partners with Allah in anything. Okay, just like other Muslims. So, so far there's no difference. No, there are many groups that leave this concept. We have many, like grave worshippers, okay, who attribute yeah. themselves to Islam, who don't come with Tawheed. And Al-Ikhlas. Ikhlasuna lillahi saffi al-qalba min iradatin siwa hu. Ikhlasuna lillahi saffi al-qalba min iradatin siwa hu fahdhar ya fatin. Ikhlas means that you do any and everything for Allah alone. Your intent is no one other than Allah. Mm, okay. This is for Allah. And the scholars, they divide the sincerity into two. Ikhlasul ibadah and ikhlasul ma'bud. Ikhlas in the action that you're doing, mm-hmm. meaning you distinguish one ibadah from the other, like you salat dhuhr is different from the sunnah of dhuhr. Ama salat fajr, the sunnah before fajr, and the fajr itself, you separate one from the other. Okay. This is called ikhlas, this is called, uh, uh, ikhlas, ama, this is called the niyyah of, uh, and the intention distinguishing between what is obligatory and what's voluntary. We're not talking about that one. Mm-hmm. We're talking about the second form, which is, um, which is ikhlas al ma'bud. Who are you doing this action for? Salafism, they're known for this. They don't do anything illa abtira wa jilla. They're only seeking, seeking the face of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Yeah, if I'm fair, I'd agree. The second foundation that Salafi stands on is al ittiba'. They follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in any and everything. And how he lived sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the way he did things. And the way he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam preached. And the way he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he started with in his da'wah. So they don't just follow him in a particular part of his life and a segment of his life, but they follow the messenger in totality. Okay. In all of his way, alayhi salatu wasalam. They follow him in his act knowledge, alayhi salatu wasalam. And the knowledge that he called to, they follow him in that. They follow in the Prophet in his actions. They follow the Prophet in his da'wah. You see? So now we look at the politicos that he's talking about. Yeah. The politicos are activists. Yes. Yeah, They're yeah, just yeah. activists. Yeah. They have no... Nashat ilmi. They don't have any is like. They don't have a say in the. Uh, in the revival, of the religion. They're trying to revive the religion, but they're doing it through activism. So they have the same end goal. They're not. They, 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 that's not. That's my point. They're not reviving their religion. They're just working towards their position of leadership. That's really what it is. It's just how can we get to power? They're working towards their own dunya, needs. To mm. be very honest with you. But they're cloaking it and they're, you know, making it look like that they're using the, uh, you know, the, the Sharia. That's what the politicals are, and that's the people he's referring to. People who have a political, uh, you know, objective, and they okay. want to get to a particular, they want to gain um, a ch- seat. Okay, the one that's really gained traction is this term Salafi jihadi. So Salafi jihadis. But, uh, let, let me let, let, let me give an example. Look okay. at the politicals that he's referring to, right? We saw it in what took place in Egypt. Those so, so-called politicos, when they came into power, was the religion, the Sharia, was it the Quran and mm. the Sunnah? No. Wallahi, the book of Allah was not judged by the deen. That, wasn't what the ju- that's what, that was what was promised to the people, right? Yeah. No, they don't really care about that. They have no desire, they have no raghba, to be very honest, once they get in power, 
the Quran or the Sunnah or this and that. Because look, if you don't study the Quran or the Sunnah, you have no knowledge of it. Yeah. When you do get into power, what are you going to use? You're going to use the what you know, right? Hmm. As for the jihadis, which is the third top group that he refers to as Salafis, yeah. the jihadis are ones who've distorted the meaning of hukum uh, shar'i. They've distorted the concept of jihad. What, is, what does jihad actually mean? You know, what does you know, what did the Prophet do in Mecca when he was in Mecca? Allah commanded Alam tar ila ladina qila lahum kufu aidihum. Allah commanded the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, take your hand back, aqimu salata wa atu zakat, establish the prayer, give the zakat, don't fight right now. You're not in you're not in you're not one who should fight. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was commanded to do what? You know, khudil afa wa amur bil urfi wa arid anil jahilin, turn away from the ignorant ones. That's how he did it. But he was also commanded to fight as well. But that was that was a time in a context with a meaning and etc. That doesn't mean our religion doesn't have jihad. Lashaka it does. Yeah. But it has it in its context. The Salafi will follow the Prophet in where he did it and how he did it. Agreed. And uh, is the that jihadis won't do that. Is that not what they're doing? So the Salafi jihadists? I mean the wa the, 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 the reality in front of us testifies to not them doing that. They've killed innocent women and children from within mm. Islam. They've Dina- the Prophet had covenants with the non-Muslims. So he had mawatiq, he had yes, wood, he did. Yeah. Alayhi and he stuck to those promises that he made. For them, there's no promises, there's no wood, there's no mawatiq, there's no pro- nothing, none of that. There are books they written on it. There are books their figureheads have written. Abu Muhammad al-Maqdisi has a kehok, he's, he's got articles and books that he's written about this concept. You know, Abu Qatad al-Falistini, you know, Kill even women, he was saying. Mm. Even women. Where, where is he following the Prophet ﷺ in that? Where's Salafia in that? You see my okay. point. Okay, so when a, an, an average Muslim, for example, picks up the newspaper and he reads, and this is a quote from the Sunday Times in Sri Lanka, for example, it's a recent event that happened in Sri Lanka. More than the uh, immediate ISIS threat, I further the argument that the larger issue seems to be the threat of, of the ideology of Salafism. Uh-huh. So what is a Muslim meant to believe when he reads something like that? He's meant to dismiss this claim because the reality is that these people are not Salafis? Well, you see, this is my point. EDL say the problem is Muslims. You don't, you don't accept that from them. Hmm. So why should a Salafi or a... You know, EDL say the problem is Islam. Exactly. So they, they say you're a problem. Yes. But, you know, you can't say... You know, you can't say... Th- uh, this newspaper is saying it's a particularly, b- it's a particular brand of Islam known why? as Salafism. Why? This is what they call it, so and it's not they're not alone in this claim. The Guardian have mentioned it, the Daily Mail have mentioned it. So why why would they say that this is it's got something to do with Salafism? What reason is behind it? They they believe that the jihadi, the fighting methodology, is something that was found in the early generations. Or if, to be honest with you, I don't even believe that they actually believe or they know what the early generations of Islam actually how they practice the religion. But they certainly see this ideology and perhaps. Some of the people who are propagating this ideology are, for example, like you said, from Saudi Arabia. Or secondly, maybe their end goal is the same, i.e. their end goal is to revive the religion of Islam the way it was in the early generations. And this makes them Salafi. Okay. I mean, right now, I mean, due to it not being the topic that we're talking about right now, if you look at these, con- these statements that these people bring right now, like yeah. for example, ISIS, uh, if you see what they bring, uh, Al-Qaeda before them, and all the groups that existed before that, they quoted, most things that they quoted were people who had nothing to do with Da'wah Salafiyyah. They, for example, quoted Sayyid Qutb. Sayyid al-Imam, for example, was, you know, it was one of the people they quoted. They mm. quote. Um, that's who they look up to. They read these works. These are the works for them that becomes, you know, the milestone. Ma'alim yeah. al-Sunnah. Ma'alim al-Tariq, sorry. Ma'alim al-Tariq, whatever it's called. Okay. Written by Sayyid Qutb and others like that. These were the works that they use, they praise. Um, I mean, don't even go far. Yusuf al Qardawi, you know, he said, he said that the last stage, I mean, I, to be honest, I didn't write it down or bring it. But he said the last stage of Sayyid Qutb's life, it's, he said, it's an extreme position of killing and bloodshed. Hmm. وشهد شاهد من أهلها. قرطاوي is an إخوان himself. He's their mufti. He's the mufti of the إخوان. Yeah. He's admitting to that. That this is what Sayyid Qutb was about. He mentioned that Sayyid Qutb's tafsir when he wrote it first, his his dilal, 
he rewrote it again and added things into it which he saw to be vital to mention because of because the you know, look, Sayyid Qutb is not a student of knowledge where he studied and he gained knowledge from it. Mm-hmm. His upbringing was not like Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's upbringing where he took from a scholar and he see, sought knowledge and he learned. It's not like the upbringing of Albani or Ibn Baz or Ibn Uthaymin or others where you would read in their lives where they studied. He wasn't. He was an activist. He used to listen to Abbas al-Aqad who is not even a Muslim. Okay. He was a, a man who was, uh, if you looked at him, he was an ishtiraqi, a communist in the beginning, Sayyid Qutb. Do you, do you see my point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he got oppressed and then he used his emotions and found the Quran and segments of the Quran to serve that. So what you're saying is that regardless of what the non-Muslim Western academics claim or the Western newspapers claim, the people that they're calling Salafi, these guys are Salafi, those people themselves are actually almost freeing themselves from the claim by their actions, number one, mm-hmm. because they're clearly in opposition to, to Salafia. And secondly, even by some of their statements, they're yeah. actually admitting that they're not Salafis. And that is sufficient as a proof against the Western academics. Yeah, I'm saying in, in Salafis, you know, if many people claim something, you look at what is the, okay, you know, if Salafis, I told you, it has a usul, it has principles, it has foundations. We need yeah. to look at those foundations. We look at that, when we look at the foundations of what Salafia stands on, what it means, Salafia, yeah. then we say you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, right? Yes. But not everybody who have different ideologies cannot all be Salafis at the same time. Yeah, because it would be contradictory. I mean, if a Qadiani comes and says, Nabiya Muhammad, there was a prophet after him. Mm. You know, people are going to be like, you know, sorry, but you're not a Muslim Qadiani. Yeah. Yeah. You're not, a, you're not a Muslim. He's claiming Islam. He's claiming Islam. He's saying I'm Muslim. Is it fair to call him a Muslim? Because he claims it? No, otherwise anyone, anybody can claim anything. Okay, fine. Uh, to end this particular episode... Um, the final question I have for you is if somebody understands what you're saying as uh, a Salafia or Salafi or Salafism being the authentic pure Islam taking it back to the early generations and understanding the religion the way they understood it how does one become a Salafi then? Well, I, you know, I'm a layman in the religion but I understand what you're saying and I agree with you I want to become a Salafi how do I go about doing that? Salafia doesn't need you to go as I say and I always mention this it's not and it doesn't require from you to go and sign a, 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 a application and then wait for the approval of the application and then the, a, membership is, a membership card is sent to your house mm. and then now you are Salafi. It's not like that. Nor do you have to give a bay'ah and a pledge of allegiance to a leader. Nor do you have to be signed up somewhere. No, no, no. Salafiyyah in simple terms is Al-Quran wa sunnah bima alihi salaf al-salih wa bi fahmi salaf al-salih the Quran and the Sunnah, you understand it on how the early generation understood it. You act upon this religion, you follow this deen in the way that the early generation understood it. You don't bring anything new, you do not deduct anything from this religion, nor do you add anything to this religion which they have, which they have added or which they have deducted from it. Okay. Salafiyya is the pure Islam. It's not a group like the groups that are out there. It's not like the t- group tablighi which has a leader, which has a haikal, an organization, it has a, you know, the permission has to come back from the main office and then he gives up none of that. Um, it's not like Ikhwan al-Muslimin, where they have, you know, the, the, up, the more you go up the ladder, the more you go, get into the circle and the yeah. more you find out what the real target is. But the rest of the people are just the supporters. Like Hizb al-Tahrir, who are like that as, as well, that the Amir said, and this said, Salafiyya is not like that. Salafiyya is man kana ala mithli ma ana alihi liyawma wa ashabi. Anyone who is upon that which I and my companions are upon today, that is Salafi. And Salafis today, we suffer from three, two types of people. Yeah, okay. Salafis, we suffer from two types of people. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned them. The Prophet said in the hadith, لا يزال, لا تزال, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي ظاهرين على الحق لا يضرهم من خذلهم ولا من خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم على ذلك. The Prophet told us here that there are three groups. One is the saved group, which mm-hmm. are the Salafis. The two remaining groups are the Mukhadzila. Mukhadzila are those who deceive the Salafis. They pretend that they're Salafis and they infiltrate them. Okay. They're like hypocrites. They pretend to be like them. They try to pretend to walk like them, talk like them, be like them. 
because the Salafi walks unique because he walks the way that the Prophet walked. Mm-hmm. The Salafi talks unique because he talks like the Prophet spoke. He carries himself in a unique way because this is what the Prophet Sallallahu did. So they pretend to be them like them. They pretend to uh, be with them and that they're supporting them and they're aiding them. But then they are backstabbing them. The Prophet told us. They're the Mukhaddila. And there's a third group which are those the Mubtila. And those who try to go against them directly and fight with them face to face. Okay. The Prophet told us, alayhi salatu salam, la yadurruhum man khadalahum wa la man khalafahum. Those who deceive them, which are the Mukhaddila, and the Mubtila, those who try to go head to head with them, Allah, the Prophet told us, la yadurruhum. They will not harm them until the hour comes. They'll always be and they will always remain. So Salafiya might look at a time that they're becoming weaker and they're becoming small, but that doesn't mean they will go. The glad tidings of the Prophet ﷺ is that they will remain They will remain until the day of judgment comes. They will remain. So I said that I had one more question, but I also have another one to add on to that. Uh, you're saying Salafi or being a Salafi is the truth and is the one saved sect. What about when somebody attributes them to, for example, being a Hanafi or a Shafi'i or a Maliki or a Hanbali? Does that mean they're no longer Salafi now? I mean, those, these Imams, they were all the Salaf that we're talking about, mm-hmm. that you attribute yourself to. وَلِذَلِكَ الْإِمَامِ الذَّهَبِيُّ He said in the Tarjama of Al-Zabidi, he said, وَكَانَ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ حَنَفِيًّا سَلَفِيًّا He said. Oh, I see. So they even they used the two together. He said both of them together. He said it was Hanafi Salafi. So a person can be both. It's not dismissing one from the other. You can be a Shafi'i Salafi. You can be a Hanbali Salafi. Meaning, like, just expl- explain on that a little bit. So someone is a Hanafi, Hanafi and Salafi, for example. What, what does well, that we, mean? We already said that we're, 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 we're attributing ourselves to the three noble generation, right? Yes. Well, these scholars are from the three noble generation. They are the Salaf that we're attributing ourselves mm-hmm. to. But when you tend to say Hanafi and Salafiya, you mean my aqidah is aqidah to Salaf. Okay. You know, because many people have now come and attributed themselves to the Ash'ari belief. Yes. And they attributed themselves to an Imam Abu Hanifa or attributed themselves to an Imam Shafi'i. You're trying to say, I'm upon the Salafiya that Shafi'i was upon. Right, I see, understood. You see. Very clear. Jazakallah khair, Ustad. Once again for joining me on the hot seat. Um, until next time, bi'idhnillahi, subhanaka wa bihamdika, ashhadu wa la ilaha ila ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. I hope you enjoyed and benefited from that discussion. Please do share it with your friends and family members if you feel like they might benefit too. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button below so you're notified of any new episodes. Check out www.thehotseatpodcast.com. That's thehotseatpodcast.com. On there, you'll find a little bit more information about the podcast and you'll also have the chance to vote for which topic you'd like to see discussed on the show. You can also ask questions on the website to the speaker himself about these contemporary modern day issues. Until next time, fi imalillahi wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.